Hi, I'm Todd Reingold, the hopeful aspirant. Welcome to another installment of I Got a Testimony. Today's guest is Miriam Lungabardi. Miriam and I have known each other for some time. It's really nice to reconnect. It's been a, a number of years, but it's been wonderful to reconnect. We go back a ways. Miriam, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. It's great to see you. You know, we have probably heard the expression that uh, man plans, God laughs. And that really is really applies to my life, probably many people's lives. But uh, I was in the midst of trying to decide um, whether I wanted to continue reconciling with my now ex-husband. We'd been separated for a year. So I just had him back in and I wasn't too, I, I wasn't too sure about whether I wanted to continue down that path. And then while I was thinking about, do I want to stay in this marriage? Do I not? I got diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. So all of the marriage stuff just got shelved. I'm like, all my energy, I can't put any energy to that. All my energy has to go to getting well and being there for my children, who at the time, uh, my older daughter had just turned four mm -hmm. and my little one, Amanda, was 20 months. I have no genetic predisposition, so I have no idea why I got the breast cancer, but it was very invasive um, and everyone was very concerned. So the treatment uh, was very aggressive. So I had to have... Um, six rounds of an intense chemo standard is usually four but my oncologist uh, wanted to go a little bit uh, more aggressively so i had a treatment every three weeks and on my well weeks believe it or not we were just talking about working out and everything i was teaching fitness classes for years uh through my before i was married through my pregnancies afterward and on my well weeks so like the first week of the treatment was usually pretty bad and then like the not that weekend but the weekend after that I'm, I was pretty like pretty well so those two weekends in between I, I still taught fitness classes on Saturday and Sunday mornings and then the cycle would come again and then I'd have my treatment I was kind of down for the count for a week and then I'm like all right I can teach these days so um being physically active I think was definitely you know helped not only to keep my body strong but, you know, those endorphins are real. Like, they really do just give you, you know, inner strength. So, you know, lost my hair. You know, my mom is buying my kids books. Um, you know, our mom has cancer. And there's like a, you know, these picture books. And there's like the bald mom on the front with the children. Um, and my kids were a great age for this. Um, my daughter at four was so accepting. Um, you know, I just explained it the way they say to in the books, you know, like I have a disease, but it's like, you can't catch it and I'm going to lose my hair, but then it's going to come back. Um, you know, it sounds all like, oh yeah, you know, but then when I did have to go for the head shave, it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, you know, but I got a beautiful wig. My sister actually bought it for me. I called it my ginger from Gilligan's Island wig. Um, and you know, throughout the process from diagnosis um, you know, which was really just out of left field. I had a wonderful, my family, of course, was fabulous. Um, my colleagues at the time, I taught in the um, Pelham School District in Westchester, and my, my families of students I was, that I had that year, as well as former families and families that knew me from the community and didn't even have me, their kids didn't even have me. I, I did not cook a meal for six months. If the girls needed a ride somewhere, my daughters, if I needed something, if they could bring something to me. So uh, they were just fabulous. I needed a double mastectomy. I had a, uh, you know, reconstruction with implants. But before my, the last day of school, which was a Friday, um, they threw me a, we called it a boob voyage party instead of a bond voyage oh, party. So. <laughs> they cut me so like boobs and then they and then they got me like pretty bed jackets I was going to be in the hospital I mean the the healthcare glory days I was going to be in the hospital Monday to Friday uh some people like don't want to be in the hospital I'm like oh no keep taking care of me because I got a toddler and a, like, yes. two toddlers at home um so yeah I'll stay and uh Oh, so they got me pretty pajamas. They got gifts for my girls. They got like a bell for me to ring, you know, if I needed something. So, awesome. you know, you have to laugh. You have to, you know, it could have been a very like, oh, good yeah. luck. And everybody said, and we just laughed. And then the night before my surgery, I had my whole family over and we had like a little party. Um, and then I went, you know, I went on in in the morning. 
I left uh, New York about 23 years ago. And so everyone that I knew from that period of my life, things are very fossilized. I have a very strong, vivid memory of a lot of people and situations. And I always, what I always think of when I think of you is just a very positive person. I always remember you smiling. I always remember you joking. Easy person to talk to, easy person to get along with. You know, my dad was a doctor and he always used to say that a person's attitude has so much to do with their well-being. And I'm sure that your doctors commented on it as well and said, you know, you have a great attitude. It's going to go much better for you to be this way. How did it change? I mean, obviously it didn't turn you into a huge cynic. So how did you interpret it? in terms of yourself, but being a mom, uh, being a wife, thinking about life on those terms and, and here's what I'm going to do when I get through this, you know, for the viewers, just, you know, mm-hmm. how, how do you cope with stress and tragedy? Well, um, I don't think there's any one answer for me or for anyone. Um, I actually wasn't thinking like when all this is over, here's what I'm going to do. I, that, that actually never crossed my mind. I was thinking as you were just saying that. I became um, very focused on uh, what was happening daily in my life up until the diagnosis. And I think a lot of um, young moms with kids, you're, you're kind of on autopilot. It's like, get up, feed the kids, do this, go to work, do the laundry, make sure that read them stories. You know, everything is very kid centered and, and just your life is just on this, you know, you know, not unpleasant, uh, you know, kind of autopilot. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, I don't necessarily have all the time in the world. And how it changed my daily life was I I was grateful for the stupidest things. Um, and I think being in a state of gratitude is something that people sick or healthy should always be in and should try and, you know, it's definitely a mindset that you have to cultivate if it doesn't come, it probably doesn't come naturally to a lot of people, but you know, beforehand, I just had mountains of laundry. And I was like, it was like the movie Gremlins. Like, does it multiply when it gets wet? Like, I'm just, I have mountains of laundry and I'm constantly folding and doing and more. And then I was like, folding those little tiny t-shirts and, you know, their things. And I was like, so grateful. I had to go to the DMV um, and renew my driver's license, thankfully, before my hair fell out. And I was waiting online and I brought a book with me. And I was just, uh, you know, reading my book while I moved through the line and people around me are just like stamping their feet, looking around, looking at their watches, looking at the clock. And I'm just like, this is where I am right now. I have to wait in this line. I need to do what I need to do. And that was also the attitude I took toward my treatment. I'm like, I have to, you know, have this chemo. I know my hair is going to fall out. And, um, you know, and then I think everybody fears like, what if mine doesn't grow back? And it was funny because I was at the airport after a couple of years later and my hair looked pretty much like it does now. And there was a woman in front of me and she had the treatment look because I, not everyone was bald, you know, some people have alopecia or whatever, but I, you know, she just had the look and uh, I, I, I asked her, you know, casually, she had a, her kids, but they were like kind of playing around. And I said, I said, are you, are you in treatment? She said, just finished. Like we were on our, we were all online to go. We were going to Florida. And they were taking a vacation. I said, oh my gosh. Like, and it was breast cancer also. And, you know, and I said, I had it. And she's like, you're kidding. Like, you're like, really? I said, yep. And then, you know, she said, can I tell my kids? I said, sure. You know, and they're like, you know, she's like, she had it. And, and uh, I said, yep. I said, my hair, my head looked just like your mom's. And they were like, really? They're like, cause you know, hers might not grow back. I said, it will grow back. I said, look at all my hair. I said, I looked just like your mom grew back, it will grow back. Uh, so that was, uh, you know, um, you know, you find opportunities to talk to people, but I think being in a state of gratitude, um, my family, my friends were just so supportive. Um, and then through the treatment, I'm not going to say I didn't have days where, you know, I was sick as a dog. Um, I gained 20 pounds because they put these appetite stimulants in my chemo because oh. so many people get sick and you know, I'm like, it's okay. Like you can let me lose a little bit of the weight, you know, like, um, but they're like, no, you have to, I, can you take that out of it? Can I just, you know, they're like, no, you're getting it. Um, and steroids and all these things. 
Um, but I did have moments where I'd be like watching my kids do like some cute thing um, or some annoying thing. And I had to be grateful for that too, that I was there to do deal with, you know, it's not all like, oh, I just had a state of gratitude and everything was so good and easy. No, it wasn't. I, you know, I'd have moments of like, oh my God, what if I'm not here? Um, you know, I was like, you make the little deals with God. I'm like, I just want to see them graduate high school, which at that time was so long ago. I'm like, that's a big ask. I, I just want to live to see 40. It's like so many years away. I'm like, that's too big of an ask. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm going to ask it anyway. And because I felt like if I could just see them graduate high school, they'd be on a path. They'd be, they would have known me, you know, but you know, and I have friends who sadly didn't get to see their children do those things. So I, you know, I'd have those moments of like, oh, what's going to happen if I'm not here? But like, you know, you can't go down that road. You could like sink into that road if I chose to put my thought energy there. And, you know, I'd have it be like, just, you know what, just stop. Stop. Let's do whatever you're doing in front of you right at this moment. I know I've been through with enough friends and family that um, the chemo treatments themselves take a long time. Yeah. And you're kind of trapped. It's one thing if I think now they're, you're able to do it at home more, but for the most part, you're like stuck in a chair, you're laying down yeah. in, in a hospital and chances are they got you separated by a curtain, but you're laying next to somebody else who's got the same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a highly stressful, depressing type of situation. So again, like what was going through your head? How did you cope? And like, was there music? Like, did you have headphones on music? Yeah, I, um, yeah, it is like that. It was just, you're kind of all sitting around. Um, and I was with a lot of old people. They were like, in fact, on my first day, I hadn't eaten before I went in because I don't know, I had no idea. I brought a book with me. I'm an avid reader. I'm like, here's an opportunity to just chill and read. I had my headphones. Um, but one of the spouses, a husband or wife of one of the older people around me went out to get food. <laughs> he brought me a happy meal. <laughs> it sounds like you were also a resource of support to other people that you met along the way. I, mean, I, was, I joined a support group strictly because uh, my therapist at the time told me uh, women live longer or breast cancer patients, maybe all, I don't know if it was all, but he's like, people in support groups live longer. It's just a thing. And I was like, oh, and I'm like, you know, I, don't, I walk in and these women are hysterically laughing. Somebody asked like, when am I getting my libido back or something? And they were like, oh yeah, it's coming back. You know, <laughs> um, I might've been the person that asked that. But anyway, <laughs> everybody just had such a great attitude. And occasionally women would come in all somber and very, mm -hmm. you know, you know, everybody processes things differently, but for the, but these women, the, the core of us that always came every week, um, we had a lot of laughs and um, I, I still see these women around and it's good. Uh, so it was, it was a good thing. So where, where are you at now? You're, you're cancer free. I will be in remission 19 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, and I still just, I don't have any assumptions mm -hmm. about longevity or anything like that. Um, but I did, you know, once I was like a year or so out, I did start traveling first, just visiting friends, you know, um, and then overseas by myself. And I just really, that talk about being in the moment like that. I found traveling alone in the moment made me just really, there wasn't anyone distracting me or like, you know, I, I can stand in front of a painting for 20 minutes in a museum, or I can just like stand and enjoy the view for as long as I want and just like think and you know be present and you just meet me I've made amazing friends from around the world and I just feel like it's all part of being present in your life and well that was a good that was a really good segue I thank you for that because that was definitely a thing I want to talk to you about and transition out of the more I don't want to call it morbid thank god that you have a really good attitude about it um some people really wouldn't feel comfortable talking about it so I appreciate that and again, it's, it's not, it's not to just talk about it. It's to kind of bless the viewer because you don't know somebody could be watching this, just got the diagnosis. Tell me um, a little bit about your experiences. If you want to talk about some of the places you visited and which ones were your favorite and why. And like you said, I met some amazing people. So just tell us about some yeah. of them. Well, my very first um, trip to Europe, I chose London and I just went for like a long weekend. Um, it's really easy to do London in a long weekend. People think, oh my God, you went to Europe. It's like, it's 
it's, uh, it's just a little bit farther than like going to LA or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I saw friends there and then, um, then I took the girls with me also to London because um, my friend had uh, some children their age. And then my sister is uh, married to a Dutch man. And so we went to um, Netherlands and visited with his family and I made friends there. And this is with the girls with me. And it was transformative for them as well. I think they really, um, you know, my older daughter is like very much like me, very, you know, drop her anywhere. She'll just like talk to the whole room. My younger daughter was a little bit more reserved, mm -hmm. um, much less so now, but at the time she was very young. And I think that really opened her world up. And now she, you know, became much more chatty with people that she doesn't know and not so reserved. I think that it was the travel and the exposure to so many different countries and languages. And I took them to Paris another year. Mm -hmm. um, we went to Bruges. Um, and then by my, so every, it's, it started out that every other year I'd bring them and every year of, I went by myself, but I only brought them a few years and then it was mostly, mostly me. Uh, I went to Thailand. I went around there for a couple of weeks by myself. And then after that, to Hong Kong while I was over on that side of the world. I would have loved to go. Oh, and I went to Laos while I was in Thailand. Um, I went to Northern Thailand on a tour and the tour guide was a local and he brought us actually to his little village. And he took us into his hut that he grew up in, literally dirt floor hut. We met his parents. <laughs> um, I mean, it was it was amazing. And, you know, they, they cooked for us. Rome is like one of my favorites. Uh, Portugal, I loved. For whatever, I mean, Rome, I think it was all the history because I'm such a history buff. Um, London too. And I know a lot of places have history. Um, and Portugal, everybody was just like, it was so cheap. It would be so easy to live there. Um, and everyone was so friendly. When I travel, I'm trying to get a sense of the place. I want to get beyond the tourism thing. I don't want people to see me as a tourist. I want them to kind of put their arm around me and say, let me show you what it's like to live here. This is why I love my country. I want you to do this. It's inevitable when you travel, you're going to have these singular experiences with people that you just never could have anticipated. So not to put all that pressure on you, but can you give us some of those examples? I met these people in Venice. They were actually on a pub crawl and um, <laughs> I was having trouble finding places to go. And then they didn't actually speak that much English, but we were doing our enough with our translators translator app and you know a little Italian that I could throw in there um so they took me on their pub crawl with them and we still stay in touch today when I was in Croatia um the cab driver picked me up at the hotel and he was like you know where to and I said anywhere fun surprise me and he took me to this beach party and I made friends there that you know I was still in touch with um so I think you know People have to be open-minded when they travel. I think some people travel and they expect it to be like, you know, you're traveling because you want to experience another culture, another type of people. Um, and so then people, some people get annoyed that it's so different from their country. It's like, yeah, because it's another country. Like, you know, like, that's why you're here. And I think the friendliest country that I've visited, one of Ireland, without a doubt. Um, <laughs> I only did a couple days in Dublin and then I went to the Dingle Peninsula, which is like, you know, touristy for the, for the um, Irish people, but you know, not every, not, and, and European people go there because it's got a, you know, it's on the coast, but you could just walk into any bar and the minute you open your mouth, anybody next to you, you know, old, young men, women, couples, just, they hear, you know, they hear, the American accent and they're like, oh, U.S. or Canada? You know, I'm like, U.S., where? New York. Oh, I'm blah, blah. just quick, everybody talking. I'm, I'm a, an unashamed eavesdropper. Like, oh, I was thinking about going there. What did you think? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I went there two years ago, you know, and then, you know, you just start conversations. That's how everybody in Ireland was. You just, everyone's talking to you everywhere. Um, and, That's you fantastic. Know, I Greece was a little bit like that. People very warm and just wanting to talk to you and you go to the restaurants and they bring you in the kitchen to show you how they make the food and you know people are just genuinely curious and they all they want to do is hear about where you're from and tell about their place and you know that exchange is is what makes travel really so rewarding it's so important 
to have that kind of diplomacy that's not on a political level, but you know, that comes from you and me and, and, and young people is just, because what I have found is what you said, human beings are naturally curious. I think that the natural curiosity is what's so rewarding, not only in the people and the sites that you see, I'm like a one thing a day person. I'm not like, you're going to get up and you're going to do this in the morning, this in the afternoon, you know, I don't want to overschedule myself. I want to pick the thing. I don't have to see everything, mm -hmm. pick the things that I want to see and do like one thing a day. That kind of feeds into a lot of what I do with the show is just say to kind of get across to the viewer. If, if you're capable, try to be capable of letting go, let go. Mm -hmm. Don't try to plan everything. We've been raised to think that our lives won't be what we want them to be. We won't get where we want to go unless we, we make all these plans. And I know too many people, including myself, that have made plans and they blew up. So, you know, I, I don't think you should be completely willy-nilly and, and whimsical. Too often, we try to be so smart. And we, again, that intellect, and we try to, and that ego gets in it. And the ego wants to always be number one and it wants to be right all the time and, and it has to be this way. And, but if you talk to most human beings, where, when did you have your most joy? And it was when you didn't plan something. It was when spontaneity, this person came into your life and you couldn't have anticipated it. You've been best friends now for 25 years. And so you mentioned earlier that you're a teacher and you, you've been doing it for some time. What made you decide what led you down that road? Well, I, I went to Boston University and I was a business major. Um, and I, I was a sales analyst in the city for five years after I graduated. And I enjoyed that work, but you know, I worked at summer camps and I taught swimming lessons and I was a lifeguard. And um, you know, my parents are both teachers, but that's actually why my mother was putting so much pressure on me to be a teacher. You'd make a great teacher. You should be a teacher. You should be a teacher. I'm like, I'm gonna be a business major. And I did, like I said, I enjoyed, um, I, I really enjoyed um, that type of work. I mean, I really, you know, I'm a mathy kind of person and, you know, I enjoyed the marketing end of it and it was for jewelry companies. So that was interesting. But um, I saw so many people just like get let go after people who'd made it their, their careers work, you mm -hmm. know, 25, 30 year people. And they're like, sorry, we're restructuring. We don't need you. Um, and you know, and my mom was like a, such a strong union um, leader in her, in her school where she taught. And, you know, she's like, you know, that would never happen if you're part of a union. You know, they can't just do that. You know, they have to, whatever. Um, so it wasn't just for job security, but I was, I was going somewhere, going to a client and um, I passed a school and I just saw like the children outside playing on the way and I was looking at the windows, you know, decorated. And I was like, I'd like to be in a school. I'd like to be around children. I'd like to be doing something, you know, a little bit more meaningful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, I, I found a program at Fordham University that was really for career changers. Mm -hmm. Well, geared to not, not only, but geared toward career changers where you're going to get your master's degree in 15 months. I started in, I think it was May of whatever year that was. And I was in a classroom by September. So I really love what I do. I, I couldn't be happier. And I'm president of my teacher's union. So I enjoy you know, advocating and, you know, helping sort things out um, when my members have issues or if they have troubles. I am very content. I, I love what I do. And I'm so happy every day. And, and I, I still stay in that state of gratitude. Like I am so grateful that I have a job that I love, that I live where I do and I have a great friend group. Um, and I try and, you know, grateful for little small things too. My, my overall message to people would be to live in a constant state of gratitude um, and accept your life, accept what's happening. I'm not saying like accept your life, just do nothing, just accept. But when you're faced with challenging circumstances and it could be big, could be like, you know, cancer or similar, some medical emergency, could be that you know you get a flat tire on the side of the road at 11 o'clock at night and it's pouring rain and it's cold this is what it you could like gnash your teeth and be oh, i can't believe this call a bunch of people post on social media look all the ugly pictures of the rain and then blah. You, know, you could do that or you could be like okay what are my options do i have a service i could call 
Should I just try and do this myself? Um, you know, just this is the situation. And, you know, it could be, like I said, big or small. What are your options? What do you do when you are in the midst? What does Miriam do to deal with these situations? Well, I do have a faith-based life. I do pray, but I also feel like you can't just pray and like wait for answers to fall from the sky. Right. You've got to pray and you've got to be digging in yourself to think, what can I do to make any part of this situation better? Even if it's just, I've got to change my attitude. But how do you do that though? How do you change your attitude? I try and find a goal to focus on, even something small and short term. I do a lot of hiking and I feel like I do believe those endorphins are real. I do believe it's easier to be in a state of uh, wonder when you are looking at, you know, mm -hmm. things in nature. Focus on something that gives you some sort of joy. Maybe you need to read more. Maybe you need to write. I do a lot of writing. Um, so whatever, whatever can bring you out of your head, whether it's doing something physical, mental, um, but you, you can't just live in your head. It's really hard to be focused on inner strife when you, when you're busy. Mm -hmm. And I would also say to that volunteer somewhere. Yeah. Like, I don't have this or that, you know, it's hard to be really focused on your, on whatever's going wrong in your life when you're busy in a meaningful way, whether it's meaningful for yourself or your family or meaningful for others um, and being physically moving. I do think all those things tie together. And sometimes, you know, depending on where people are, it's hard to dig, dig for that strength to do that, mm -hmm. but you have to take small steps and try, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate you sharing that and everything else. And I appreciate you being on the show and it's been, you know, wonderful okay. connecting. This is Todd Reingold, the whole glass brand. Let's all aspire to retire and stay inspired. God bless.